Well, for more on the growth of the disruptive technology industry, I spoke to Danny Leipziger, Professor of International Business and International Affairs at George Washington University. I began by asking him how this sector is contributing to growing economies. There are certainly advances in productivity that will come with uh, new technologies, uh, on top of which someone has to produce the robots and the 3D printers, so there's uh, going to be an impetus there. Uh, and then there are aspects of, uh, of economic activity that we didn't foresee, and I think they're anticipating that there will be new products, new services. I mean, 20 years ago we didn't have Google Maps and we have a lot of applications that come from that. Uh, so there's no doubt that there's a positive side of technology and that uh, uh, we're, we're seeing a, a new wave, I think, of, uh, of advance. Now, some people say disruptive tech does create jobs, but others disagree. What's your take on this? Well, I think, as with most uh, technical advances, the first impact is job displacing. I think it would be a mistake to think that this is a benign uh, activity that uh, everyone will benefit from. Uh, there will be job losses uh, and the question is uh, uh, how, how extensive will they be? What will public policy be? Uh, governments in general are, have not had a great track record in uh, the areas of retraining and reskilling and cushioning uh, some of the, uh, the job displacing uh, technologies. So. Uh, no doubt there will be some disruption in the labor market, uh, which will not always be positive. And are there some countries that are perhaps in a better position or better prepared to really deal with that transition? Well, I think uh, there's evidence from the OECD uh, uh, that certain countries uh, spend more on what we call active labor policies, which is basically the reskilling, retooling uh, kind of activities. Uh, and some of the Scandinavian countries have been more successful with that. Uh, whether it's because they're just better at it or that their workforce is more homogeneous or that they're only in a certain number of sectors, uh, I don't think we know. Uh, the U.S. spends almost nothing uh, as a proportion of GDP on active labor market policies and many of our programs, what we call adjustment assistance, uh, which was set up in relation to trade, uh, displacement, um, many of them have not worked very well. Now in terms of what's actually driving this trend, what are some of the factors behind it? Well I just think digitalization has had a lot of offshoots and uh, so now we see uh, a lot of possibilities that uh, were not available you know a decade ago. So uh, you may go to a radiologist today but a decade from now a machine may be more accurate than the radiologist. Uh, we may have cashless uh, societies. Um, there, there are a whole range of apps and a whole range of technologies that on the positive side can be uh, time saving, uh, they can be life saving, uh, they can be climate saving. Um, the problem is that we also have to be able to deal with some of the downsides of disruptive tech. Now with that being said, disruptive tech, one of the goals behind it is to really, people who really need it. What's being done to ensure that people can really benefit, especially those who really need it most? Well, I think there are two aspects to that. Uh, one is there's certainly an area of uh, information that is now free, right? So the Google Maps is essentially free. So uh, consumers can benefit uh, and essentially the marginal cost is zero, uh, is what economists would say. And so you can spread the benefits of that. Uh, more to your point about people that uh, need assistance, uh, we see a lot of uh, new innovations uh, that are pro-poor, right? Um, you can find uh, uh, artificial knees being manufactured, uh, you know, uh, for $100 in India. Uh, you can find uh, uh, eyeglasses for a, a fraction of the cost of what people currently pay. You can find uh, tests uh, uh, for medical uh, illness. Uh, so innovation can be pro-poor. Um, it's a question of also public policy towards that. Now in terms of looking ahead, what are some of the key advances that you think could really take center stage in the coming years? Well, I think the studies tend to look at the service sector because, uh, I mean, we can talk about robotics, you know, and, you know, we have Henry Ford, we have automation, we have robotics, okay, there's a, a path there. But I think the more interesting and more dynamic area is in the service sector. Why is that? Um, 
Well, I think uh, artificial intelligence, uh, we don't like it when we get, uh, when we have to call a phone company and we are put on some uh, uh, revolving kind of uh, a system, but uh, actually uh, there are tremendous advances that can be made uh, in terms of accuracy and efficiency. So uh, the studies that look at which sectors are most susceptible to disruptive technologies um, are now looking at the service sector. And uh, so we see it in education, uh, online courses and MOOCs. Uh, we see it in healthcare. Um, and those are the two of the largest employers, um, health and education. So um, I think the disruption, uh, we tend to look at you know, how things are produced. Mm. Uh, but I think we also have to look at how services are delivered.